everybody, my name is Chase Pipes and you're watching Chasing History, brought to you by American Digger Magazine and the Smoky Mountain Relic Room. And we are out exploring the southeastern United States, but particularly the mound building cultures of prehistoric Native America. And we are at Spiro Mound in Oklahoma with archaeologist Dennis Peterson. Dennis, thank you so much for having us out here. Now, you're the site director for Spiro, correct? Right. This is, we've done a great episode on our joint venture with Seven Ages Audio Journal. We just got done filming or recording an excellent episode of that. Be sure to check that out. But this site has absolutely blown my mind because I had no idea of the importance of this site. I mean, this is pretty much one of, if not the most important prehistoric Native American sites during the Mississippian period that existed. And what is so incredible about, about it is, is why it is here. So you've got a site far away from, you know, other sites like, you know, that we're familiar with like Cahokia or like Moundville or Etowah. And then we're all the way out in Oklahoma. Why is this site here and why is it so important? It's important because of what's just to the north of us, which is the Arkansas River. The rivers are the highways in prehistoric America. But actually, up until we get the international highway system and the, the railroads. So if you wanted to go and tie together the eastern U.S., the main way of doing that is by using boats. Boats are dugouts, piros. They can run up to 60 foot apiece. They have, some of them have sails. You can get anywhere in the eastern U.S. within five weeks by boat with a lot of stuff. Five weeks. Five weeks. That's insane. So if you control the Arkansas, you control the access to the entire west from here. The Arkansas, at this point especially, is extremely important to control. Because at this particular point on the Arkansas River, as it goes from Leadville, Colorado, all the way down to the Mississippi River, this particular point the Arkansas cuts through a limestone ridge. A part of it to the north is called Wilson Rock. Down here is the main part of it, which is uh, Swallow Rock. That constriction, that cut through, means the river is in a much smaller channel. Meaning economically, the folks here at Spiro had the toll booth on the I-40 of the past. Okay. What it also means is that the river, when it goes into flood, the energy is squeezed into a much smaller zone. That means that when it comes out here on the downstream slope, the energy in flood will go to the north and east into what we call the pawpaw bottoms. Means this area is in a shadow zone. So that it goes and it gets the deposition of soils, but it doesn't get the destructive forces of flooding. So you've got the, the, the flood waters coming down and it hits this narrow spot. It backs up and it overfills these vast flood plains, depositing sediment that can rejuvenate the plants that they're trying to grow. And that's absolutely what you need. If you're going to have a city of 10,000 people for a thousand continuous years, you got to be able to feed them. The women are the farmers. They're working eight to 12 hour work days to provide 80% or more of the food. They were farming all of this down here on the bottoms. You have huge expanses of farmland that's all being done by hand. Remember, there are no draft animals back then. So it's all by hand, by women and the children that they had that were using as their workforce. They're doing it by hose, which are mostly stone with, that can weigh up to six pounds a piece plus a handle, and uh, just plot after plot after plot for a city of 10,000 people for a thousand continuous years. And this is a point in Native America's history where you get massive agriculture being produced throughout the entire southeastern United States. Throughout the entire U.S. as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, basically we have had domesticated plants uh, being uh, farmed in the eastern United States anyway for the last 4,000 years. But it comes to culmination, the height of its development during the Mississippian period. Is right, is right, right here right at Spiro now. and at and throughout the rest of the eastern United States. Not only did the Mississippian develop because of a very stable environment, huge surpluses, massive population growth. I mean, Cahokia, at the time we had about 10,000, had about 50,000 people. 
Moundville and Etowah, the other two major ma centers, they have somewhere around 20 to 30,000 apiece. That means you have to have a lot of food, which means you have to have good farmland and practices. Now, in most of the places, like Cahokia, Moundville, Etowah, they had so many that they could supply the needs only if they allowed for some areas to be fallow periodically. That may not have been the case for Spiro because of this rejuvenation from the Arkansas River. Okay. So you've got, you know, all kinds of, you, you've got food down, you've got a population booming, and so when those two things are, are, are there, you have really more of a need to, to control or to create trade for the population and the civilization that's there in the immediate area. Sure, and that's why bounds are built. Okay. Regardless of the type of mound that we have here at the site, there's one burial mound, two temple mounds built for the main religious political buildings, and then nine house mounds for the primary leader, kind of the president, if you will,'s home to be built upon. But all of them are man-made, they're all accretional, and they're all built for one real purpose. That's to say, look at me, I'm in charge and you're not. This is the case throughout the Mississippian area. Tens of thousands of mound sites that are created from 700 through 1500 AD. And they're all built to be able to hold people together and to manipulate those folks by this presence of the elites. So tens of thousands of mound sites. The vast majority are single mound sites. So one mound created for a building to be placed on, and that building would operate like a county seat, control 10, 15, 20 towns around it. They in turn are controlled by bigger centers, which operate like state capitals, and then they in turn are controlled by the big four, the four major centers. Spiro, because it controls the Arkansas and the Red River Valleys, controlled the west. Moundville in Alabama controls the south central. Etowah, Georgia controlled the southeast. Cahokia up in East St. Louis controls the North Center. Now each of those is autonomous but interconnected and those connections were held together mainly by Spiro. Spiro did so by creating an ambassadorial network. Folks from Spiro stationed strategically, big cities, major resource areas, and then to tie them together they create the only pan-tribal writing system for the U.S. prehistorically which is where we get a lot of information about not only uh, what they looked like, but who these people were. These were Cadoan speakers in this region. They become parts of the Caddo and the Wichita. But we also get to see what they believed, how the world was created, where first fire comes from, major ceremonies, heroes, monsters. All of that was written down, sent through their ambassadors to the rest of the people of the nation. And then when those ambassadors received this conch shell, the copper, the stone, the things that show their importance, when they died, they're brought back here and eventually interred in the one burial mound down on the bottom. So that I don't I don't know if you caught that or not, but this is what makes this site incredible is because they had writing. Not in the alphabet form like we're familiar with, but they were able to put their ideas down in a form that could be read, interpreted, and understood. So let's do this. Let's walk around the site and show us some of the major features of the site. You know, where you're talking about, you know, you've got, it, it's the, the, you used this analogy earlier where, you know, the, the, the head person is on the top of the, on the top. Let's look at some of these mounds and explain what's going on there, the dynamics sure. of, of, um, of power. Okay. okay. All right, you guys are ready? I told you this site is epic. <laughs> So now we know why the site is here and we've got the development of, of the population of this site. You know, you've got to bring not only this site under control, but spread your influence throughout the region. And what, what features on the site can tell that story? Well, the influence in the rest of the, the Arkansas Basin and to an extent the Red River Basin is really because of those single mound sites, those county seats that are all tied to Spiro. But Ultimately, it's this site and its ceremonial position that everybody is turning to. Think of it as kind of uh, the equivalent of Vatican City. Okay. So ceremonies all take place here, not only for the site, but for the region. The main focus of that will be the temple. And that's where the temple inside of it would have burned the, the symbol of the sun, which is the first fire. In fact, in some of the art in Spiro, you have how that first fire came to be. 
which is integral in the religious system, not only at Spiro, but throughout the eastern United States. So right back behind us, we have a temple mound. Yeah. So it's a half pyramid shaped mound that would have had a platform on top that would have had a, a temple, a, a building on there. Right. I mean, it's not just a religious center. It's also political and economic as well. So this is really where everything kind of takes place for the living. It, out here to the east of, uh, to the north rather, of where we're at right now is the plaza. That's where all your big ceremonies took place. That includes what happens at the busk or green corn and at the solstices and equinoxes as well. So at those periods of time, all the men who, have had, who aren't impure anyway would be showing up, maybe 30, 40, 50,000 guys all out here no women, children, or dogs are allowed. In fact, if they come in on one of these major ceremonies, they're executed. So the women keep them at home. Oh, wow. So you have, on a major ceremony, say a solstice or an equinox, when you have uh, these power positions for the sun. And the sun's important because it's the, it's the top of the spiritual pyramid. Uh, it is the most powerful spiritual entity. And the primary leader, the person who would be the equivalent of the president, was often referred to as the great sun, the grand soleil in the French, because he's the one who communicates directly with the sun. Think of him as kind of the equivalent of the Pope. So uh, when the sun's at its furthest points, north and south, so at the summer solstice, or at the winter solstice, or at the equinoxes, the fall and the spring, which correspond to planting or harvesting periods, each one of those periods there would be a major ceremony here at the site. Maybe 50,000 guys would have been here. During that period of time, it's usually about a three-day ceremony, for three days you would have had all these guys here fasting, praying, communicating with the sun. But they're led by the example of the primary leader and the other ceremonial leaders which would have been in the temple. Now in the temple, you have the first fire, the sacred fire, the symbol of the sun on earth. During this three day period, whether it's a solstice or an equinox, for those three days, they would have not been eating, drinking, or sleeping. They would have been in prayer and control. They're trying to connect to that spiritual world. The primary leader, the person who's the great son or the, the equivalent of the president, he's sequestered away on one of three house mounds. House mounds are created for the primary leader's home to be built upon. So at the summer solstice, when the sun's at its furthest point to the north in our relationship to it, when the sunrise, sunset rather, would be over house mound three. And for those three days, if there's not a permanent house there, for those three days there would have been a temporary building placed there so he'd be sequestered away. Same thing for the autumnal and the vernal equinox on house mound two, or at the winter solstice on house mound six. Each of those is there specifically for those ceremonies to be in conjunction with it. So for those three days, the day of, the day before, the day after a, a solstice or an equinox event, the sun will appear to set in the same location. For those three days, the primary leader would be sequestered away from everybody else. For three days, no food, no drink, no sleep. When he comes out on the third day, he will come up to the temple where the other major leaders are live, are, have been for the same period of time. He will then tell them what the son told him that they were needed to do better or what they were doing well in some cases. For three days, he's going to be sequestered away. But of course, you can't just jump into a ceremony. Since in their understanding, everything has a spiritual connection, that means anything that's alive, anything that's dead, anything you've eaten, anything you wear, could still have that ceremonial connection. And you have to get rid of it, so you're not influenced. So for the primary leader, one of the things they would do first is to smoke sacred tobacco. Tobacco, of course, is a New World product, but this would be a very strong tobacco. And you would be inhaling it, but you mainly, for this purpose, is going to swallow the smoke. Now, any guy who's tried his first cigar behind his grandpa's barn knows <laughs> you swallow that smoke, it makes you green around the gills, makes you throw up. And you kept throwing up until you had no more food left in your stomach. Then you're prepared for that three-day period. Your body doesn't like being treated this way. No food, no drink, no sleep. It starts to rebel. One of the things it does is create natural brain chemicals called endorphins, which allow for visioning to occur. 
So at the end of that three day period, he's coming out and going over to the other leaders who have done exactly the same thing around the symbol of the sun, which is the first fire. He tells them what the sun wants them to know. Then they all come out here to the edge of the, pl of the temple mound to the plaza. This is this big ceremonial area, the big civic center. 50,000 guys out here. They also have been going through three days of no food, no drink, no sleep, but they first had to cleanse themselves. And one of the ways they would do so is by drinking black drink. Some groups it's called white drink because of its cleansing. It's an extremely caffeinated drink. Imagine espresso on espresso. It also has boiled into it Ilex Vimetria, American Holly or Yupon, which has a mild toxin and you drink it and it makes you throw up. Can you imagine 50,000 guys out here all up chucking in the first couple of hours as a ceremony is ready to start. So for the next three days, no food, no drink, no sleep. The primary leader comes out of his enclosure, comes up to the temple. The guys all start gathering next to the temple mount. So you have 50 guys kind of pressing up against that one mount. When he comes out with the other leaders, they all get told what the leader knows that the son has told him. As a communication, As a communication. From the son to exactly. the leader to the people. Exactly. And that reinforces that power and position, not only for Spyro, but for the entirety of the Arkansas Basin and ultimately for the entire U.S. Because so that same type of ritual is going on at sites all throughout the southeast. You have you have people who who are in power on these temple mounds that are communicating with the sun that communication from the sun to that person of power then gets transmitted down to the people and everybody's happy the corn is growing and everything's awesome as long as it's growing yes as long as it's growing <laughs> right and that's the, that's the basis of power for the entire Mississippian period. So one thing we haven't done yet, uh, and uh, is what is the dates that we're looking at here? What 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 time? What's our time period? Well, the Mississippian basically is 700 through 1500 A.D. The mound building starts after you reach a certain population density, so it starts about 900 A.D. Uh, and then it continues on up until about 1500. So. You know, it's a kind of a sliding scale, but by 1500, the Mississippian, as a national confederation, has collapsed. A hundred year drought cycle means that people lose confidence in the elites, and that means that national system collapses we'll in, them. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into, into the collapse yeah. here in a bit. But one thing that I want to I discuss is, and, and this is what makes Spyro such an important site is, is, is its trade, the economics of it, and why this this site is the site, not because of the population, but because of control of that trade. So let's let, let's let's go talk about that. Here. All righty. All right, you ready? Okay. All right, let's go. So one of the things that's fascinating about prehistoric Native America is the trade networks that existed, and they were trading vast items. But what would a trade look like on a site here locally? Well, it would have taken place over on the plaza, just right back here behind us. Uh, it's not only for big ceremonial positions, but it's also for smaller ones. It's also where you have dances. It's also where you have any trade going east and west of this point. Because of that river going through that narrower channel, it gives them the toll booth on the I-40 of the past. So this being the big city west of the Mississippi, if you're going east or west of this point, you're going to stop here to trade here. This is also the reason why Spyro connects to everybody else, is that river. So along the Arkansas and then the Canadian, you can go all the way to the Panhandle of Texas. So in the Panhandle of Texas, we have a, a place called Alabates Quarries, which is just outside of Amarillo. And that's be the middle point between the Southeast and the Southwest. So when Spyro's developing, the Mississippian is developing, which is 700 through 1500 AD, during that early period, when you have this very stable, very predictable rainfall pattern, huge surpluses, it's not just affecting the Mississippians, it's affecting the folks in the Southwest, what we usually used to refer to as the uh, Anasazi and the Hohokam. Mm -hmm. They're at a disadvantage, though, because everything for them has to go overland. That's got to be on your own two feet. There's no 
major waterways to allow you to go and take canoes all over the place. So in the Southwest, those things have, that are being traded tend to be very lightweight. You're not going to have commodities being traded because you can't carry in them. But lightweight stuff, olivella from the Gulf of California. This is a sea snail. A, yes. Sea snail that's used in beadwork. Um, cotton from the Southwest in the Four Corners predominantly. Uh, stone from all over the place would be coming by foot from up the Colorado Trade Network from the Gulf of California to the Four Corners, from the Four Corners to the Rio Grande Pueblos, from the Rio Grande Pueblos to Alabates Quarry. That's a long way. A <laughs> lot of ways. <laughs> That's awesome. Yep. I mean, it's a huge, yeah. I mean, think of it. Trade with Spyro meant that you had trade not only to the east, but all the way to the Gulf of California. I mean, it's literally the entire continent. You've got trade going on right here. Yep. Because California's a long way. It's a long way. <laughs> but these folks wouldn't have gone there because if you're in the east, right. yeah. if you had to walk, you were unthrilled. Short distances, yeah, but you can't carry very much on your own two feet. You've got about a max of about 50 pounds. And that's just not enough to make it worthwhile for the east. But the boats, 60-foot boat, carries a heck of a lot of stuff. Now in the Southwest, they're used to that. Short distances, well, and long distances as well, on foot, carrying 30, 40 pounds of material, means these lightweight stuff, cotton, uh, olivella, stone even, can go all the way from the, from the Gulf of California to the, great, to the uh, Alabates Quarry overland. From that point east, it's all coming by boat. So you can move a lot of material very rapidly anywhere in the eastern U.S. That includes the cotton, which the only prehistoric lace, uh, large pieces, here in the U.S. is from Spyro, made from cotton that's coming out of probably in thread. Uh, and then it's a bobbin lace, so it's woven into this very intricate lace form so that's been it, preserved. So is it like clothing, or is it like It would have been decoration? a ceremonial uh, material, probably a shawl. Okay. Uh-huh. Right. And it's a really cool piece. Well, we only have a fragment of it, but if it was incomplete, if it had been preserved completely, it was just an incredible, incredible yeah. piece. But more fabric is preserved here than anywhere else in the U.S., and that's part of the reason why this site is so special. Right. So you have those materials go into Alabates Quarry. Alabates becomes a middleman because of the, the stone that's there. Um, it's reds, blacks, whites, sort of a greenish color intermix modeled. Those are major ceremonial colors for the South, well, the whole U.S. So because it models it, it, it blends them, it's a very ceremonially important stone and traded all over the place. So Spyro goes and takes it by the, Col the Canadian River to Spyro, from Spyro by the Mississippi River, and then all the way over to Virginia. Now, do you see goods from the east coming here and then going west? Yeah. Well, at least coming to here. Yeah. How much of, that, of the materials coming from far distances would go further west is pretty minimal because once you get outside of Spyro, the status of the people further west is less. And so they're not going to have a lot of fancier items, copper and conch shell right. materials, but the people here would have. Yeah. So uh, conch shell from the tip of Florida, the like Visicon Perversum and Contrarium, is coming here by boat in these, along the Gulf Coast and up the southern seaboard. Uh, you have other materials like uh, copper from uh, Georgia coming in here. Uh, you have copper, most of the copper uh, is coming from the Great Lakes down the Mississippi River. Spyro has an ambassador up in northeast Iowa, so they have access to it. Uh, stone from western uh, Kentucky and stone from eastern Missouri is coming in here and then in, uh, creating these big effigy pipes. Beautiful, beautiful, wonderful pieces that show people as they saw themselves. Spyro has ambassadors stationed all over to facilitate that trade and interconnection and to facilitate the, the conch shell engravings and dissemination of information. So are, is that type of artisan work being done here on site? I think some of it is. Some of it may be elsewhere. I know that we have materials that are coming in that were made other places, but those tend to be individual pieces rather than big bulk items. Okay. Uh, so most of that probably was made in workshops, 
under uh, probably more than one master artisan. I mean, you're talking about 800 years, so there's yeah. going to be a long time. But one of the neat things about Spyro is that we get to see the same artistic stylistics in stone, conch shell, copper, fabric, wood, that go across media. Most sites don't have that. They have one kind of item that seems to fall into their category that they like to work or at least they like to own. And Spyro just has more of it and more diversity of the art and more elaborateness of the artwork itself. This is a phenomenal site that has importance not only to prehistoric you know, Native America here, but also to artistic work that's done throughout the world after these pieces were found and seen and studied. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, we have 60 different tribes that are part of the Mississippi and uh, once Europeans come in, of course, most of that population decreases, but Spyro's almost the only artistic link that those tribes that were in the Eastern US have with their heritage with their past. And as a result, those groups that ultimately end up being removed in Oklahoma many times are using Spyro art as their connection. It still has the same power today as it had a thousand years ago. And that's one of the major themes about Spyro is the art. The art here is phenomenal. I mean, it is, it is beyond anything that's created anywhere else. One of the fascinating things about the, the art here at Spyro is, is just how realistic the, the, imager, the images are and the kinds of stories that they can tell. Everything that you've been telling us in this entire you know, episode is stuff that's just not, not, that's not just found in the archaeology, but is also found through their written record and through the images that come off these shells. What does, you know, shells like this tell us about their trade and, and, and everything? Well, first of all, uh, what you're seeing here is one of the shell engravings that shows the use of canoes. Mm -hmm. And not just canoes, but canoes with sails. So it allowed for Spyro to be able to connect with all this nation by use of those canoes. They're big. The big ones go up to 60 foot long. But from the art at Spyro, we know that at least some of them had sails. That means that you can go downstream by just following the flow. But especially in our area, where because of the Washita Mountains and the Ozarks, it moves air from east to west in the morning. So you could utilize a sail to be able to go upstream and not have to paddle all that way. Okay, hold on. I want you to you to listen to this. And here's the evidence. Native Americans had canoes that had sails on them. That's something that I've never seen in any other art. That's nothing. I, that 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 I mind that idea and that idea is so incredible. And I think it adds to the to another one of those things of why Spyro is 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 the hub because at these at these major places you have major technology and adding a sail onto onto a canoe that is major technology that allowed you to do your job better and to have a sail on a canoe that's that's mind blowing that's so cool it is and it's really understandable when you're talking about this portion of the Arkansas River where that flow in the morning of the airflow typically is going to be from the east to the west, which means you can go upstream. Now, I don't know how widespread the use of, of, uh, of canoes with sails was. Right. I mean, they just don't preserve very well. Right. Now, we have canoes preserved all over the place. Most of them are cypress. That's what would have been used here as well, but it's made in the southern Mississippi Basin. So you cut down a humongously large tree, hollow it out by chipping it out and burning it out, and then it would be traded all over the eastern U.S. So they're not making these big boats, at least the biggest ones. Here, they're trading it because of this national trade network that is held together by boats. So in the art, we get to see those folks as they would have looked when they are in those canoes. I mean, you get to see body tattooing, hairstyles, fabrics, basketry, whatever they needed to use or bring with them, we get to see it because of the art here at Spyro. The art at Spyro is like a thousand year old photo album 
No other place in the U.S. really has that opportunity. Peace here, peace there. But at Spyro, you get to see people as they saw themselves. This is revolutionary. Yeah. For archaeologists, we're usually stuck in, with bones. And your bones can tell you a lot about it. I know a number of forensic archaeologists that go and do this. But it's more generic. At Spyro, they did this art. And we get to see what they look like. We get to see hairstyles. We get to see what size and shape their nose is. We get to see what kind of clothing they wear, what some of their uh, affiliations, like clan associations or society in, in closures. All of these things are depicted in the art and almost nowhere else in the U.S. Most of the U.S., before Europeans come in, when they depict people, they typically do it in an abstract form, stick figures exaggerations. They do that here too, but they also have this very naturalistic. So we're not just talking about people in the generic. We're talking about people a thousand years ago in the specific. It's, it's, it's as close to a photograph as we can get to them. That was not done by somebody else, but that was done by them. Exactly. It is them reaching out from the past and showing us what they looked like. Now, there's some other pieces. Let, let's go look at some other pieces. Okay. All right, come on. What we have here are some of the pieces of conch shell and other adornments that would have been used by the leadership here at Spyro to show importance, power. Uh, down here, you have an ear spool. Mm -hmm. uh, that means piercing the earlobe and then stretching it out. Some of them go way up to three pounds a piece. It is a... The most of them are stone, sometimes they're copper, sometimes copper covered stone, sometimes cedar with a copper covering. Cedar uh, by itself wouldn't have been important enough, but by adding the copper, it gives a, a additional status. Copper and conch shell have the same social value as gold and diamonds. So the more you can include those items in your ceremonial gear, the better you liked it. Uh, beads out of conch shell, again, conch shell and copper have high status. So beads would be utilized. Ear spools made out of conch shell. Um, tons of tons of beads were made from spiral, uh, conch shell here at Spiro. I mean, by the bushel loads that were coming out of individual burials. Think of it as having the equivalency of having a bushel load of diamonds in your burial. Yeah. It's again, another way of saying who's in charge and who's not. The conch shell, in part is to show people. So in these, you can see how they would have looked in a kind of a two-dimensional imagery. Sometimes there's also a three-dimensional, which is kind of like what you see here, mm -hmm. uh, that would have been uh, adhered to a uh, plug. So it would have, it's made from shell, but it would have an adherence uh, uh, glued on the back, and then it would go through the earlobe, uh, used that way. This last one is actually a monster. Uh, it's a part of one of the conch shell cups. And it would have been, uh, let's see, Yuktena. Yuktena is the, the snake bean. And since this art is largely to talk about the cosmology, uh, so how the world and the, and the cosmos operates, you have this world, the underworld, and the upper world. Those three levels are represented by different animals in the art. So the underworld is usually represented by snakes, but also uh, fish and turtles in the art here at Spiral. This world is usually represented by humans, but also deer and raccoons. Those are also clan symbols, so it may be associated with that in individual grouping as well. And then the upper world is usually represented by birds of prey, hawks, eagles, falcons, as well as the sun and the moon symbols, which are usually an equidistant cross inside of a circle and then with embellishments. This one is one of the monsters. Uh, their understanding is that there are reasons why bad things happen. And the monsters are going to be a part of the reason why that happens. Mm -hmm. And there are heroes who are given power and it's depicted in the art uh, they are representatives of Morning Star, or in the northern part of the Mississippian, Red Horn. They're the same guy, but he's a hero. And in the art, he's given a staff to give him power during a, a need to go and fight a monster. And then when he's done, he gives it back. Well, 
in the art here at Spiral, the, the pipes, uh, there's Big Boy over here. Big Boy is also Morningstar or Redhorn. And he is the, this is the person who was in that position in the ceremonies. So when you're in ceremony, you have people in key positions. Uh, one of those would be deer dancer. Since the men's main food contribution is in large meat resources, deer, turkey, elk, this guy's job is spiritually to connect with the spirit of the deer and make sure they stay in large numbers close at hand. This deer dancer pipe is probably the original owner as he looked when in ceremony. That would have been about 900 to 1000 AD. This is one of those three dimensional imageries that we get to see people as they saw themselves not like archaeologists want him to be, but the way they were. So in one hand, he has a deer head rattle. The other one, he has a fan or whisk, which would be used in ceremonial dances. His earlobes have been pierced, and in them are pieces of stone carved to look like deer's antlers. And then his hair has been braided and coiled in two coils, so it looks like an erupting uh, deer's antlers getting ready to come out. His job, using this pipe, would be to smoke tobacco, cleansing, and then in ceremony to call the spirit of the deer. He also is the one who coordinates all the men cutting and burning out of the deep forest, open spaces, parklands. See, the denser of forest is the fewer animals it can support, doesn't have enough browsing. So one of the ways they could increase the deer population, rabbits, squirrels, possums, turkeys, whatever, was to open up these open areas anywhere from a few acres to hundreds of acres. They would burn and cut them out so they would maintain them. This guy's job is to maintain them using his men to be able to keep them open. That means they don't have to work as hard. You got more deer around, more places that you can hunt them, less work for the guys to do. And they're only working three to four hours a day, producing about 15% of the diet. So the less work they like, the better. Uh, <laughs> It's an amazing depiction that Spyro was able to show us, not just these are the artifacts they used, or this is the art they created, but these are the people who lived a thousand years ago. And in fact, the deer dancer is a position that the Caddo and the Wichita still have. They don't often do the dances and ceremonies involved, but they still have those positions in their, their understanding. Wow. And see, that's what's incredible about Spyro is, and it, why it's unlike any other Mississippian site, is because the artifacts show you who these people were, what they looked like, what they dressed, the things they held, what the, who they revered. It, that's what sets this site apart from any other in North America. This is cool. Now, one of the things I want to get into is is the language. So is there something we can go look at that talks about the sure. language? Well, um, we saw a little bit with the, with the yep. shell that has the boat, uh, the canoe. Um, yeah, let's talk about this one over here. Okay, come on. So what sets Spyro apart from every prehistoric site is the fact that it has a form of language, of picture-based language that doesn't have influence from other places, correct? It doesn't have influence right. from Mesoamerica. It is uniquely its own thing. That's mind blowing. I had no idea of that before I came to this site, that you've got, this is, this is the only <laughs> prehistoric language in the United States, in what is now the United States. That's fascinating. How does this language work? And how does this link all of these places, you know, sites like Cahokia or sites like Enola or Manville or even smaller sites throughout the, the, the various Mississippi River valleys. Well, it's an iconography. It means picture writing. You know, all of our languages, well, almost all of them, start out in an iconographical form. And then it evolves into hieroglyphics and it evolves from that point into a written language like ours. So you start out trying to just pick information that you want to make sure everybody understands. Not just by oral information, but through a written word. And Spyro is holding together two-thirds of the U.S. So this conch shell engraving 
is their ability to go and hold together this national confederation so they're doing the same thing regardless of what cultural background you were a part of or what language you were a part of held together through this this writing system so that everybody shares so and this one here is the bus for green corn ceremony it's one of these uh dance formulas so the bus for green corn which takes place in the autumn equinox uh, we were talking about the enlightenment and some of the, the announce to the solstice and equinox sunset and this is a part of that dance ritual which occurs after the uh the great sun tells everybody what they need to know so in the dance formulas that occur afterwards this would be the beginning of the new year and this is one of those dances so within it you see the dancers the twins that have their own regalia their their clothing so you have these uh aprons skirts kilts if you would that are made from sewn together rag pig skins so that when you're dancing those tails flutter back and forth you have uh really a fan in one hand, a rattle or dance rattle anyway, in the other hand, which allows people to go and keep that, uh, that rhythm going. There probably was a dance drum, but that doesn't get depicted in the art. We're not absolutely certain exactly if that's taken place, but historically that's the case. That's important because the imagery that we see here, the dance formula that we have, and the, the formula itself is actually in the shell in that lower portion in the center. That tells us the cycles, the, the counterclockwise, clockwise record, uh, rotation, uh, the dances that go around in, the, in a particular manner are all written into this talk show. But that allows for the leaders here at Spyro to do these ten dances from generation to generation to generation. But it also allows for them to share that with people who are in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and up in Illinois. This so everybody's doing the same thing. And that's important. If you have everybody doing different things, you're not going to have any unity. But by having this commonality, it allows for this entirely diverse group of people to share this understanding of the world and the past. The, 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 the Muscogee Creek still have this dance formula apparently. Wow. Thanks. And see, that's the power of, of Spiral, is that they were able to create this language that would, you know, this would be engraved here and it would be given to a messenger who would take it down the river and say, see these pictures here? Well, here's what this says. Here's, here's how we do this dance or here's how you do This holds everyone together through imagery and through language and that's what makes this site the site. <laughs> That is so cool. How many different, um, uh, I guess you could, I don't know if you could call this a book, but how many different books or volumes are there in existence that you know of? Well, there are hundreds of these shell engravings. Now, some of them are replications of each other. Right. Uh, but the, I'd say probably a good 150 different storylines that are depicted in the shell engravings by themselves. 150 different storylines. Yes. And what are the ranges of the stories that are being told? They can be anywhere from hunting uh, imagery, so that this is what we're hunting in the, this time of year type of thing, uh, kind of a learner's book, uh, to the major ceremonies like the giving of uh, power staffs from the sun, the, the spiritual sun to the great sun or morning star or red moon uh, to solve issues, giving them power. So it can be anywhere from just mundane type of stuff into this very spiritual, very high elite type of, of focus. And that was being engraved in the punk shell so they can tell everybody else how all that society had to work. Because it wasn't spiral by itself. You had thousands of leaders throughout the Eastern US that are doing the same thing for their areas. Right. They're conducting these same ceremonies. Well, how do you know they're gonna do it? By creating this writing system and sharing this iconography, this ideas, the standardized ideas among so many different groups. So it's being engraved here. The story is being written here and then sent wherever to 
Ohio to Alabama to Tennessee to Louisiana, wherever. Three quarters, three quarters of the United States is under control of this group here, all bound together through this iconography and this language. That's just, <laughs> that's just so cool. It is. And that's the thing we have to keep in mind is that our view of Native American is so limited because we're seeing them after the European intrusion mostly. Yeah. But before that time when the Mississippian is going on, you have this nationwide connection. You have a group of people who hold together for 800 years roughly, and yet we don't hear much about it. Yeah. Well, and if the climate hadn't have changed, it, they would have probably progressed and progressed and progressed. Certainly. Well, I mean, you see this uh, similar types of patterns with other groups in the new world. The Maya, the Aztec, the Omen, uh, the Inca, they follow similar patterns, different, different positions with Europeans coming in, more state-level societies than uh, priests say, but they're doing roughly the same thing. Different time periods, different stage of development, but they're trying to do the same overall control and, and leading that they need to do, and this is a part of it. Now, what's the furthest reach that Spyro had? Directly, uh, their direct control would be the Arkansas Basin and the Red River Bank Basin. So from central Oklahoma, central Texas, on to uh, central Arkansas and east western portion of Louisiana. That's direct control. Right. Now, uh, in southern half of Kansas and southwestern Missouri as well. But in terms of the national, I, I don't know, control, coordination would be probably better because this is a confederation. Right. Basically everywhere east of the, of the Rockies. So wow. from the Rocky Mountains east, Spiral is uh, the main coordinator. Wow, that, that is so cool. See, prehistoric North America is mind-blowing. We've got a lot more to show you about this site. Ah, this is so cool. <laughs> so one of the most important things about Spiro is, is an access to the river. And that access to the river allowed it access to the heart of the Mississippian world. Go in a little bit about that and, and about how Spyro was able to send ambassadors, you know, all, I mean, as far, far away as Florida and all the way up to Iowa. That's insane that they went that far. Well, I mean, it is for us because we think about Native Americans being small in number, widely dispersed and hardly connected to one another. But the Mississippian, completely different, 180 degrees from what that view is. And the reason is because they're able to move anybody and anything along two thirds of the US because of this river. This connection goes all the way up to Leadville in Colorado. This goes all, all the way to Colorado. All the way up to Colorado, all the way over on its tributaries to the Panhandle of Texas. So anything from the Southwest coming East goes through Spiro because of this river. Anything that was coming out of the plains, bison material, scapulas, tibias, furs, hides, meat, that's all coming from Spyro through them to Spyro to the rest of the eastern United States. Things here in eastern Oklahoma, Bodart, Osage Orange, which is the main bow making wood for the eastern U.S., is only found here in this region. And so if you were a guy in the east and wanted the best bow, you had to deal with Spyro, and the way you got it was through this river. This river is the highway of the past. That's what all the rivers are. The coastlines as well, but the rivers primarily are where the agricultural lands are and your connections, your trade routes are all through these rivers. And so Spy people from Spyro set ambassadors out to each of these different areas. And these ambassadors carried conch shell that was artwork that were, talk about that. Okay, so you've got this national connection through the river systems. You have these huge cities like Cahokia, Moundville, Etowah, every place in between, tens of thousands of mound sites that are all being interconnected. And Spyro uses ambassadors, people from Spyro stationed strategically, either in the big cities or major resource areas, 
to hold the entirety together. The way they do that is through this trade network. So things from the west going east, east to the west. But it's also because they create the only pan-tribal writing system for the U.S. prehistorically, which is the conch shell engravings. This is what holds together this national, religious, and political network. If everybody believed the world was created differently, or ceremonies were to be conducted differently, holding together this confederation without warfare would be pretty close to nothing. But Spyro, using the conch shell engravings, so the conch shell, which is a very special type of conch called Bisicum perversum and contrarium, comes from the tip of Florida. Spyro has an ambassador there, so it goes by boat directly from Florida to Spyro, engraved with the information, like the first fire story or uh, major ceremonies like the bus. Engraved in the conch shell, sent by messengers who will know that information down pat. So it's, it's an iconography. It's not a writing system like ours. It's uh, more like when you go into the cathedrals of Europe and you see these big stained glass windows. In a pre-literate society, this is how a priest tells people the information they need. So you have a, a stained glass of John the Baptist and all the components of the story are in that stained glass. Same thing happens with the first fire story or the world's creation in the conch shell engravings. It allowed for a messenger to be told what that meant until they had it down pat. So it's a, a triggering device. No matter how many times he has to tell it, he can tell it the same way. So there's little or no distortion because he's got the writing right there. The conch shell not only is an information source, it's an authority source. Since only the leaders at Spyro have access to it, if you have a person coming into your town that says they're from Spyro and shows you this conch shell, you can be assured that he's from Spyro. It predetermines acceptance of the information, lowers the opposition to that authority. It goes up to Cahokia or Moundville or Etowah and the ambassador there receives that messenger, receives that conch shell, receives the information. Then it becomes the possession of that ambassador. It shows their status, their importance in this life. And when they die, it continues to show their importance in the afterlife. When they die, that ambassador cinder class would be brought back here with all that fancy stuff and then buried in that one burial mound, the Craig Mound. Layer upon layer upon layer, over 800 years that, that site, this site is used, over 1,100 liters and millions and millions of artifacts were brought with those bodies and interred with them. And see, that is what makes Spyro the important site. Not only do you have control of, you know, the east, west, north, south trade, you also have rivers that you can access the heart of the continent and the, all of the southeast. And what makes it such an incredible site for the artifacts is that you have these ambassadors, these leaders coming back to this site to be reinterred from whence they came. And that is what makes Spyro the most important prehistoric Native American site in the Mississippi period. That is awesome. That really is really cool. So things don't last forever. And let's go explore the downfall and demise of Spyro. What's fascinating about, you know, the rise of the Mississippian culture is, is that, you know, eco or I guess ecologically or environmentally, it was in a, a excellent period to be alive and to grow corn. But that's something that didn't last forever. So what, what are some of the reasons that led sites like Spiro and, and other sites to start decrease and, and be depopulated? So from 700 to about 1300 AD, the entire southern half of the U.S. was experiencing this incredibly productive period. Longer growing seasons, huge productivity, very reliable. And the elites are, of course, saying the reason for all this good is us. We're the ones communicating with the spiritual. We're the ones coordinating all you guys. And it works until it doesn't. About 1300, the entire U.S. goes into an environmental shift, a drought cycle. A drought cycle isn't necessarily a lack of rain, although since 1300, the U.S. has been incrementally drier. Instead, it's a cycle change. So the amount of rain is about normal, but instead of being spread over that long growing season, it becomes mainly focused late spring, 
early summer where you get six months worth of rain. And it may all fall in one month, which means huge amounts of rain is pouring down this river valley. The Arkansas, the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Ohio, all through the eastern U.S., they were experiencing the same basic problem. In fact, the drought cycle of 1300, which lasted for over a century, is almost identical to what we've been experiencing since the 1970s. So that same environmental change is affecting people. Now, people were still planting. They were still following the advice of the elites. The people in charge were saying, now's the time to plant. Now's the time to harvest. But the problem was is the weather wasn't effectively working with them. And these are supposed to be the guys that are in charge. They have that direct communication. The guy on top of the temple talks to the sun and that communication allows weather to, weather to work, everything, uh, the corn to grow, the whole nine yards, and this is starting to break down. Exactly. And so you've got about a hundred year cycle. People are starting to get upset. They're saying, you know, we're doing what you told us to do. You said the sun was upset. We had to do this. We've been doing this, but it ain't working. Something's wrong. And the elites start to think about, you know, how can we get everybody still working with us? But we've got these problems. The environment isn't cooperating. So something about that past, something about that spiritual connection, that those power objects, the shells, the... Uh, the pipes, those kinds of things that are used in ceremony, there's something wrong with them. They worked for hundreds of years before, but now they're not working. So there has to be something wrong with the object. Exactly. Yeah. So when about 1350, the, the people are so fed up with the elites, the elites have to take drastic action. They say, well, the old ways aren't working. So what we need to do is jump start. We're going to end the old, start anew. And the way they decided to do that is by retiring through the portal of death into the afterlife, all the objects that they were using from 900 AD up till 1300. And the portal of death, the portal area between this life and the afterlife, right over there, the burial mound. It's the mound. Yeah. Now, this mound has been used since the 700s. It has layer upon layer upon layer of elite burials. Only the leaders are buried here. Regular folks are buried in cemeteries close to their town, but for the elite, this is a way of saying they're special in this life, but also in the afterlife. And along with their bodies, for hundreds of years, go along all those items that show that they're special. The copper, the conch shell, the stone that showed their personal power are going to be buried with them. So where would you retire the temple stuff? That's still powerful. It still has spiritual connection. But you can't just throw it out. You've got to treat it with respect. But in order to jumpstart, these things have to be retired. And so on top of that biggest lobe, at that point, all the mound is, mounds, just like the burial mound, are built layer upon layer upon layer. Uh, so about oh, a little less than halfway up the biggest lobe, at that point in time, so 1350, that was a flat topped pyramidal shape. So it was just flat on top. They go in, they place a whole series, a circular round, about six feet, 16 feet in diameter of poles in the ground. And then they would tie the top up at the top. So, kind so of it's like a beehive. Yeah, creating a beehive. Yeah. yeah, but it's just gonna be the poles to begin with. Then they have this huge ceremony where there would have been tens and tens of thousands of people from all over would be coming, and not just in the Arkansas Valley. There are folks that are coming in from the lower Mississippi Basin, the upper portion, the southeast. Everybody who's important is going to be coming here for this ceremony. To witness this reburial Ex and recharging of their religion. Exactly, because Spiro was the seat not only of power locally, but nationally. Right. So they go and they, when the day of the ceremony was to take place, out of the temple, they have this big, parade down from the temple mound to the burial mound with everybody all the elites carrying basket loads or individual pieces that for hundreds of years have been the most precious most protected sacred items in their ceremonies and they're bringing them down and they're placing them 
in north, south, east, west orientation. The same orientations they would have had in the temple. They're going to place them in this round structure. Anything left over, that's all put in the middle. So dance regalia, costumes, things like that. It's all going to be placed there. And it's everything from copper items to shell items to clothing, textiles, feathers. Everything, everything. you can imagine. Yeah. And some of those things are actually being brought by these visitors from elsewhere being brought in specifically for this ceremony. So sort of their sacred items that they've had in other centers, other towns and villages, they're bringing them here also to be interred. Exactly. So it's kind of like a massive, everybody is bringing all of their stuff from this old religious, you know, cult or group to re-inter, to re-jump start their religion. Exactly, to retire it into the afterlife. Yes. Because this is a national religious understanding. It's not just local. And these folks may not have brought all of their fancy stuff, but they brought samples of it, parts of it, to be able to sacrifice into that afterlife. So it's all placed in time inside of that round structure. Once the ceremony finishes, they go and they plaster on clay to completely enclose it within this structure. So like a non-permeable clay. Exactly. It's difficult for water to get in. And it's and it's just like when you would done. I mean, it's completely sealed. Yeah. So it's just like a house, but you don't have a doorway. And so there it sits. They finish the ceremony, and then layer upon layer upon layer for the next 150 years or so, you have more burials being brought in. It completely encompasses the area that was enclosed by that temple area. Creating a tomb. Uh, it's entombment of the materials, yeah. yeah. And uh, we call it the central chamber. That's what the commercial diggers, when they dug into it, called it. Or we call it the spirit lodge as well, because that's where all those spiritual items ended up being interred. And so finally you end up with the rest of that mound covering with burials and dirt what had been the structure. Wow. And it's completely enclosed, hidden from sight. Wow, that's so cool. It is cool. And that's the thing. This particular event is trying to restart the world for them. Unfortunately for them, it, it didn't, didn't work. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, our weather is driven by two major forces, the oceans and the sun. And unfortunately for us, they don't listen to us very well. Right. Even though the elites tried to make it, it just didn't work. And eventually people say, enough is enough. The only people we see getting advantage in this time period is the rich and famous the elites. We don't believe in you anymore. We had tried to jumpstart it the way you told us. Didn't jumpstart it. We tried to uh, to do all the agricultural stuff that you told us to do. Didn't work. And so people say, Chuck, it. we don't need these big cities. We spread out and we're into smaller river valleys. We focus on our own needs, not this national trade network that only the elites seem to be benefiting from. The Mississippian because it's a national system, it spirals influences out, the system itself falls by the wayside. And so the people don't disappear, they just disperse from these major centers. Yeah, I mean, the city around us was about 10,000 people at its height. It goes to about 2,500, 3,000. Yeah. Um, the other major centers are seeing the same difference, that the people are still there, but they're just more spread out, localized focus, no longer that national connection. The trade network just collapses. Now you've got some fascinating archaeological evidence for this uh, this ceremony that you talk about. Tell us, and this has been found recently. Tell us about what work has done has gone on. Well, uh, in the past, well, almost two decades now. Well, almost a decade from nineteen. I mean, twenty twelve till twenty. Well, until then. Uh, OU, the University of Oklahoma, and the University of Arkansas, and the surveys of Oklahoma and Arkansas have had a joint research project in remote sensing. Uh, not excavation, that's expensive and difficult to do sometimes, but in the remote sensing, that seems, that's using various technologies to send energy into the ground and measure rebound. And what we have found are a number of what we call anomaly patterns. That's just where the, the soil in there is different. We don't know what it is until we do excavation. Well, in 2012 to 2014, we did research. 2014, we had a short, small excavation series to test some of these anomalies. And what we found were these little, small, temporary, like less than a month, 
buildings that were being built out here on this open space. What we think is happening is that for that 1350 period, when they were doing that transference of the, of the temple's material into the afterlife, that big ceremony would have been tens of thousands of people here that normally wouldn't have been here. And they're coming in, they're constructing these little small, smaller than 10 foot in diameter structures, using them like hotel rooms. So they're not cooking in them, they're not heating in them, they're not uh, leaving anything behind. But after the ceremony ended, they pulled up everything and they walked off. That's so cool. And that's something that, you know, you you didn't have much evidence before. Exactly. Until you had this survey done. Exactly. Because it's so faint. It is used such a, over such a very short period of time. There's no real evidence for it other than if you catch it in the right light or the right soil moisture, you can see that pattern, well, postal patterns yeah. for those small structures, unless you have this remote sensing data, which gives us that pattern. And it's that new technology that's come out recently that's been able to enhance and expand the story here at Spyro. Oh, absolutely. How much is still, how much work is still left to be done? Oh, um, we control 150 acres. That includes the 12 mounds and a portion of the elite city. Less than 15% has ever been tested, mostly in the 30s. Of the city surrounding us, though, which covered over five square miles, less than what percent? That's that. That's in. That's mind blowing. Yeah. You know, you you have the most important center, you know, of the Mississippian period in the south in North America that has yet to be explored archaeologically. Yep. But you've got all this great. But you're technology is now starting to come online where you can do where you can see and explain the story without having to excavate which is also equally as fascinating it is uh, now it doesn't give you everything you need but it does help you figure out something's going on here yeah so when we have the resources we have the questions that we want to have answered we can come to those areas and answer those questions through excavation in fact this summer uh 2022 OU, the University of Oklahoma, will have a summer field school out here for about six weeks to be able to test some of those anomaly patterns. That's that's awesome. That's awesome that work is still going on and the story is still unfolding here at this site. It's a never-ending puzzle that we just keep finding little bits and pieces of puzzle pieces. Well, that's history and that's archaeology. So, Dennis, thank you so much well, you're for having great. Welcome. us out. If people want to come see this site or if people want to get a hold of you, uh, where's some information that they can, how, how can they do that? Well, if you go to the Oklahoma Historical Society's website, which is okhistory.org, uh, they're our parent organization. We have a, a website presence there uh, under their site's name uh, tab. You can also look at our Facebook page, uh, Spiral Mounds Archaeological Center. And I keep posting stuff on all different topics there. Or you can contact me at spyro at okhistory.org, which is our uh, email address. And we'll have all that up on the screen right now, right here, right, right there, on the screen, on the screen, right there. This is definitely a site worth visiting. The story of prehistoric North America is still being told, is still being understood. And there are sites literally in your neighborhood, in your city, in your town, in your country that are mind-blowing beyond all of proportion. I urge you, urge you to get out and explore North America's prehistoric path and especially come check out sites like Spyro because this, this, is, this has completely changed my perspective of prehistoric Native America by coming to this site and seeing it and we hope we've expanded your perspective as well. We hope that you guys will check out our other episodes that we have done on this joint Chasing History Seven Ages audio journal episode. We have got a great interview with Dennis on site for the Seven Ages audio journal podcast. You can go and listen to that episode right now and get a deeper understanding of this site and its importance. Dennis, thank you so much thank you. for having us. Remember guys, be sure to check us out on Facebook and be sure to like and subscribe to this video. All that other jazz and stuff and everything, you, you know how to do it. Remember, history rocks. <laughs>